Okay, thank you very much. And uh, may I ask to show the first page, just the title page of my presentation. On the screen, so the title page, the title is Kolmogorov Complexity as a Hidden Factor of Scientific Discourse from Newton's Law to Data Mining. And uh, uh, I am very pleased that uh, I am speaking right after Professor Tsukiki because we uh, will be, I will be treating much the same material, but I will look at it uh, from a viewpoint of a mathematician and in particular, instead of giving a wide panorama, I will sort of focus on uh, certain uh, traits that are visible to a mathematician. So uh, usually the world of complexity, as it was used already many times in this room, is used as a metalinguistic expression referring to certain intuitive characteristics, uh, sheer amount of data, visible chaotic char character um, of data and or space distribution, time evolution of a system and so on. This talk is centered around the precise mathematical notion of Kolmogorov complexity. So I would like to have this first page. Oh. Well, it, it should have been there. On, it is on the table, uh, I mean. The, the, I have sent them uh, through a computer to the secretariat and asked them to be uploaded. And uh, I was said that, yes, this is so. I asked them to be uploaded on the local computer. Okay, I will continue in the meantime. Uh, so, uh, the precise mathematical notion of Kolmogorov complexity originated in the early theoretical computer science and uh, it is measuring the degree to which an available information can be compressed. Uh, there are two points to stress here. First of all, the notion of Kolmogorov complexity does not refer to history uh, nature or whatever. It refers only to the data which are actually or potentially available to us. The data can be in the form of uh, theory, uh, observations, uh, conjectures. Anyway, you should imagine the data as a kind of text, real or potential. And the notion of Kolmogorov complexity uh, then will, in principle, give you a number, which is the complexity of this text, not of the universe, not of life, not of evolution. Okay, and then there is another notion of compression. Compression, I will say that we have a phenomenon of compression of the text when we have written a program which is considerably shorter than the text itself, but that can generate this text after a process of computation, maybe even very long one. So compression of information. The measure of compressed information is the Kolmogorov complexity. And in the first part of my talk, I will argue that a characteristic feature of basic scientific theories from Ptolemy's epicycles to the standard model of elementary particles is their splitting into two very distinct parts. So a, a scientific theory is split into two very distinct parts. One part of the relatively small Kolmogorov complexity 
They are called usually laws, basic equations, periodic table, uh, natural selections, genotype, mutations. And another part of indefinitely large Kolmogor of complexity. Uh, so please stop at the first page, the very first, at the title page. At the title page, please, yes. And another part of indefinitely large Kolmogor of complexity, uh, which are called initial and boundary conditions, phenotype, populations, and so on. The data constituting this lab part is are obtained by plant observations, focused experiments, and afterwards collected in growing databases formerly known as books, tables, encyclopedias, and so on. In this discussion, Kolmogorov complexity plays a role of the central metaphor. Now, please, the first page. I will illustrate at first uh, what I said right now on two or three examples from the history of science. Then I will show the mathematical content of Kolmogorov complexity in more precise environment. So first of all, planetary movements. Uh, after the discovery that among the stars observable by naked eye on a night sky, there exist several exceptional moving stars, planets, there were proposed several successful models of their movement that allowed predict the future positions of the moving stars. And of course, the simplest of them placed all fixed stars on one celestial sphere that rotated around the Earth in a way reflecting nightly and annual visible motions. Uh, so, according to Apollonius of Perga and Geparchus of Rhodes and Ptolemy of Alexandria, uh, the planets were moving in a more complicated way along circular epicycles whose centers moved along another system of circles, eccentrics around Earth. As uh, David Park remarks in his History of Physics, in the midst of all this empiricism, set the ghost of Plato, legislating that the curves drawn must be circles and nothing else, and that the planets and the various connecting points must move along them uniformly and in no other way. Since in reality observable movements involve accelerations, backward movements, and so on, the two circles in place of one for each planet at least temporarily saved phase of philosophy. Uh, paradoxically, however, much later and much more developed mathematics of modernity returned to the image of epicycles that could since then form an arbitrary long hierarchy. The idea of Fourier series and later Fourier integral transformations does exactly that. They are modern epicycles. Uh, next page, please. It's well known, at least in general outline, how, no, the next page, uh, uh, let me see, yeah, yeah, how, uh, Copernicus replaced this geocentric model by heliocentric one, and how with advent on Newton's and Galileo gravity law and dynamical law, the resulting solution of two, the two-body pro problem, planets started moving along ellipsoidal orbits, with Sun as one focus rather than center. It's less well known that, uh, to the general public that this approximation as well is valid only insofar as we can consider negligible the gravitational forces with which the planets interact among themselves. If we intend to obtain a more precise picture, we should write a system of differential equations. And this level, a new complication, emerges again the word that was used many times already in this room, Generic solutions of this system of equations in the case of three and more bodies cannot be expressed by any simple formulas, unlike the equations themselves that are simple. Kolmogorov simple, they are quite short. Moreover, even qualitative behavior of solutions depends 
in extremely sensitive way on the initial conditions. Very close initial positions velocities may produce widely divergent trajectories. Uh, thus, the question whether our solar system will persist for the next, say, uh, 10 power 8 years cannot be solved unless we know its current parameters with, with unachievable precision. This holds even without appealing to much more precise Einstein's description of gravity, or without taking into account comets, asteroid belts, and moons of the solar system, and so on. So it goes without saying that a similarly detailed description of, say, our galaxy, taking into account movements of all individual celestial bodies constituting it, is unachievable from the start because of the sheer amount of these bodies. So I repeat once again, the one part of our classical physics is Kolmogorov simple, even if we uh, take as a um, highest achievement of classical physics, say Einstein equations of gravity, they're still expressed in a very small amount on symbols. But the Kolmogorov indefinitely or infinitely complex part then is relegated to incredible amount of objects that should be taken in account if we want to give more and more precise definition. In some sense, this is true also in biology, but uh, uh, there are people here that, of course, are much better equipped than me. Okay, um, now uh, I should also probably only to, uh, s to stress one more thing, that laws, Kolmogorov simple part, can be discovered and efficiently used only if and when we restrict our attention to definite domains, space-time scales, and kinds of matter and interactions. Uh, for example, in what I said before, there were no place for chemistry. Now, one more example, which also was uh, many times uh, mentioned by Professor Tsukiki, the standard model of elementary particles. So please, pages uh, four, five, and six, just in turn. Four, five, and six, please. Um, pages four, five, and six. Yeah, and again, four, five, six. No, 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 no. Four, five, six only, but uh, in, uh, slowly. Four, five, four. Okay, stop it here, please. So what I have written here is the uh, kernel of uh, the nucleus of the standard model of elementary particles. Uh, this is the so-called Lagrangian of the standard models. It takes, as you will see, with, with bare explanations, two and a half pages. But what I, uh, and it is very difficult for a non-specialist in uh, the uh, physics of elementary particles even to appreciate what is written there. But nevertheless, it is Kolmogorov simple part, at least a small community of specialists in standard model understand what is it is all about. If I show a particular term in this Lagrangian, they will tell me, ah, 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 ah this is uh, Higgs boson, ah, 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 and then the group SU2R, uh, say, uh, is the symmetry group of such and such thing. Uh, but, uh, as I said, the standard model is still Kolmogorov simple uh, in the uh, sense that it has a part consisting of basic laws which is Kolmogorov simple, although this Kolmogorov simplicity is already far from being really so simple. Now, uh, I will speak a little bit not about uh, science, but about mathematics because the notion of Kolmogorov complexity is so fundamental that, as I said, it essentially is applicable to any kind of text. And the simplest kind of text is just uh, a sequence of uh, sticks uh, which tells you how many sticks there are, so just the numbers. 
so please, page seven. Page seven, please. Yeah. So uh, I will explain that when I'm speaking about compression, which is an essential part of notion of Magorov complexity, what I'm saying is that I'm speaking about programs that allow to generate something. And the uh, first object that is known to just to everybody in this room, but probably not always is associated with program, is just the positional notation. So, uh, uh, so symbols like 7, 13, 19, 84, they are just programs for generating, if necessary, uh, the corresponding amount of simple objects like sticks. Of course, uh, for 1984, even uh, it would be unrealistic even to expect that if I type here uh, 1984 uh, 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 strokes or sticks, you will be able to check whether uh, I did it correctly because it's too, ma too many. Anyway, uh, that's the point. Uh, the point is that in any positional notation, the number n can be expressed in approximately logarithm of n signs. And this was the first uh, interesting, historically very interesting and important discovery, that this information can be logarithmically compressed. And this is systematic. But the point is that uh, certain numbers actually have a much shorter expression, and this is exactly the numbers that we usually uh, use in uh, statistics, in discussing our world in general terms, and so on. So 10 power 8 uh, 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 does not actually require 8 uh, signs is just uh, one, uh, 10, 0, and 8, so only three signs are needed. And if you take 10 power, 10 power, 10, uh, you use it using only 10 signs, whereas actually the uh, decimal length is much larger. So this is a very interesting and not trivial example that uh, in the sequence of numbers and actually in the sequence of texts of any kinds, there are suddenly somewhere, very, very long texts that are Kolmogorov very simple. Uh, if we leave the domain of integers and leap, say, to such numbers as mathematical uh, pi, 3.1415926 and so on to infinity, it looks like it has infinite Kolmogorov complexity, but it also doesn't have an infinite Kolmogorov complexity because uh, there is a program which is pretty, uh, pretty uh, short, such that if you input there the position n after the dot and say, I want now you to calculate the decimal sign there, it will do it for you. And Kolmogorov complexity of pi is the complexity of this or size of this program. So you see that mathematics allows uh, for objects to be called simple, even if they are, uh, look like infinite objects. Okay, mm, now, uh, uh, point, uh, please, uh, page f eight. What I want to say now is that in the history of humanity, discoveries of laws of classical and quantum physics uh, that represent incredible compression of complex information stresses the civilization aspect, the role of Kolmogorov complexity, at least as a relevant metaphor for understanding the laws of cognition. And uh, uh, what is interesting in a very informative book, uh, this, The Sense Number, Stanislav de N considers certain experimental results about statistics of appearance of numerals and other names of numbers uh, in natural languages. Uh, essentially, his um, uh, graphs show that certain numbers appear much more often the numbers between them, 
Unfortunately, in the book, this graph is not reproduced in a clear enough way. I tried to use in the, uh, in the lower graph, they refer to different languages, uh, to, I tried to, to show how they should actually look. The point is that approximately, when you are speaking about very large numbers, powers of tens, then powers of tens and small, uh, with small deviations around them appear much more often than everything in between. That's the point. And this means that somehow a probability of appearance of some number and actually of some text is the lower, the more Kolmogorov complexity of, uh, of this is. And there is a very interesting um, notion of a certain a priori probability, say, of a number or of whatever. And this a priori probability is w roughly, I'm not quite, uh, uh, quite correct here, but roughly its uh, probability is approximately one divided by exponential of Kolmogorov complexity. So if Kolmogorov complexity is very low, then probably this text will appear. If it is high, then probably you will never uh, uh, see it. And generally, there is a very interesting notion between Kolmogor relation between Kolmogorov complexity and probability theory. It turns out that even if you speak about numbers and if you speak about, say, uh, dyadic or, or decimal representations of the numbers, if the uh, Kolmogorov complexity of this number is approximately logarithm of this number, then it looks like a totally random thing. You cannot say that it is random. It was not generated by any random process. Nevertheless, it is undistinguishable of something that is random. And uh, uh, computer scientists use the notion of oracle uh, suppose you want to calculate something, but you cannot calculate all data that is needed on the road. And then you say, okay, assume that we have an oracle that produces what is necessary for further calculation. And uh, my uh, favorite metaphor is that civilization is an oracle that produces Kolmogorov simple things in the process of historical development. Everything that is Kolmogorov complex is either not produced at all or relegated to the observational dom domain. You look at something, you, you, you measure it very, very precisely, very, very, very precisely, and in this way you get the Kolmogorov complex things with, that you cannot predict in any other way. Okay, and... Um, my last um, page, almost last page, uh, is uh, dedicated to new cognitive toolkits, uh, world way, uh, wide web and databases. In please page nine, nine, yeah. In uh, summer 2008, there, was, there appeared an issue of the Wired magazine and its cover story ran, the end of theory, the data deluge makes the scientific method obsolete. And the message of this essay written by editor-in-chief Chris Anderson was summarized in the following words. The new availability of huge amounts of data along with statistical tools to crunch these numbers offers a whole new world new way of understanding the world. Correlation supersedes causation, and science can advance even without coherent models, unified theories, or really any mechanical explanation at all. There is no reason to cling to our old ways. It's time to ask, what can science learn from Google? Uh, well, there are uh, several, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, several various kinds of objection against, against uh, this uh, credo. But uh, 
the point is that what Anderson actually wants to say is that human beings are now happily free from thinking over the data available. Allegedly, computers will take this burden upon themselves and will provide us with correlations replacing the old-fashioned causation that I prefer to call scientific laws and expert guidance. Okay, I will leave aside uh, such question as uh, how correlations might possibly help us to understand the structure of universe or predict the Higgs boson. I want to quote uh, only the precautionary tale uh, from page 10, please, page 10. In uh, page 10, please. In 2000, in year 2000, Peter Austin, a medical statistician at the University of Toronto, and his colleagues conducted a study of all 10 million uh, 674,000 and 94 and 945 residents of Ontario, aged between 18 and 100. Residents were randomly assigned to different groups in which they were classified according to their astrological signs. The research team then searched through more than 200 of the most common diagnoses of hospitalization until they identified two where patients under one astrological sign had a significantly higher probability of hospitalization compared to those born under the remaining signs combined. Leos had a higher probability of gastrointestinal hemorrhage, while Sagittarians had a higher probability of fracture of the upper arm compared to all other signs combined. In other words, if you are happy with correlations, then you can return to astrology and to whatever else, actually, I believe. And so the last page, please. So, Koda, what can science learn from Google? Think, otherwise no, Google will help you. Thank you for your attention.